Father in heaven, we just thank you as we come here before you today, Lord. We come here, Lord, uh, looking for a blessing, knowing that we're not going to be disappointed every time we gather with you, Lord. But we come here to be a blessing to you on this holy Sabbath day. Touch our hearts, Lord. Touch our minds, Lord. Touch uh, our eyes, Lord, that they won't be distracted, Lord. Our ears, that they won't be turned aside, but that will be keenly tuned into the word that you have for us this day. To the end, that we can learn to serve you a whole lot better than we do. Lord, be with me. Uh, touch my lips, Lord. Anoint these lips. Make them clean to proclaim your gospel, Lord. Let your thoughts and your words just come directly from your throne on high. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot going on in the world today, uh, to say the least, an awful lot. And because of technology and so forth, we get to see more and more. But there was a time when, you know, information and news could not be shared around the world the way it is right now. Something happens in one corner of the world, literally, literally within seconds it's known half a world away. And just the, 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 the technology and so forth is amazing and how fast information travels. However, however, we know that when Jesus returns, every eye is going to see him. The whole world is going to see him. It doesn't matter where your vantage point is. And he's going to come from one point, isn't he? And the whole world is going to see him. Now that's awesome. That's getting the word out. That's putting the news out. But there's some things we know that are taking place and they're going to continue to take place until that time when he does return. And these are the days that we're living in right now. And you, uh, we've all heard the term and seen the term the Great Reset. They talk about the Great Reset all the time. Well, I was thinking about that, and that's why I entitled the sermon, The Great Reset. There's going to be one single reset that's going to be the great, what they're calling the great reset now, they mean, okay, well, we're going to do this, this here, and we're going to stop the economy, then we're going to restart it, we're going to stop this, then we're going to restart it. Well, um, In, in my line of work, I work for the school system here in Lake County, and uh, I work in the electronics department, and the majority of my job, by far, the majority of my work consists in installing, servicing, and repairing fire alarm systems. And you go to any school, and you ask them what the great reset is, they'll tell you that the great reset is when you make that thing be quiet over there. Because when it gets a trouble on it, it beeps. If it goes into alarm, then it goes into alarm and it dumps the school and so forth. The great reset to that person in the front office that's listening to that thing all day is when you make it be quiet. Now, and you'll get there and they'll say, well, we're, we're glad you're here. We've been hitting the reset all day and it just keeps on doing it over and over and over again. Well, because the reset's not the fix. In other words, if you don't go out in the field and clear the condition, you hit the reset button, the panel's going to reset for about a second, then it's going to recognize there's still a problem and go right back into trouble. Well, the problem with what the world calls the Great Reset is they're not going to fix the problem. They're going to attack symptoms. What's the problem? The problem is sin. No starting or restarting of the economy or, 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 or any other thing, any other system man can put in place that's not going to fix the sin problem. And there may be some of them that go into with the best of intentions. Maybe with some of them their motives are pure. But being human nature, being what it is, there's always going to be some people involved that have less than pure motives. There are going to be some in there that say, what's in it for me? If I can't get mine out of it, then I'm not going to be interested in it. But see, God, God looks at it as far as what's in it for you and I. God is love. God's motives are pure 100% of the time. And there's a day coming that we're looking forward to. But God has the means 
to fulfill all of his promises. God fulfills every single promise. There are people who say, you know, I'm going to fix the economy, I'm going to fix health care, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to fix that. And even their best attempts are very feeble. They don't work because you can't get rid of the sin problem. Only God's going to get rid of the sin problem. And when sin is gone, that's when the great reset takes place. But we know what it's going to take. We've read the back of the book, correct? We've read the back of the book. If you would turn in your Bibles um, to Joel chapter 2. There's some scripture that I'm mighty glad to... There's always scripture that I'm mighty glad to find in the Bible, but this is one of my favorites. This is one of the scriptures that whenever I look and I see why things are such a mess, and even I look at my own life and I compare my own life to the life of Christ, I say, boy, my life is such a mess. It's nothing like what it was before Christ. And still on my best day, I look at myself, I say, boy, am I, am I such a mess. Boy, you know, I read Romans chapter 7, and I, you know, I think of Paul, and, and in my mind I'm saying, I hear you, brother. I feel you, brother. I identify with you, brother, because I feel the same way. My life is such a mess. But then I open it up, and I read something like Joel chapter 2. And verse, we're going to begin in verse... Uh, in verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. My people shall never be, you will never be sorry for selling out to Jesus Christ. You will never be sorry for turning it all over, lock, stock, and barrel, by your Father in heaven who loves you. My people will never be ashamed. And you know, uh, the, the, the whole uh, idea behind the... The series, I never meant it to be a series, but on, on the first sermon back a couple of months ago that I preached on it, I'm like, man, I got enough information for 15 sermons here. I, there's no way I'm going to get it done at one point. But the whole thing about being redeemed and radical is it doesn't take much in this world and especially in the church to be considered radical today. If you stand upon the word of God and upon the truth of the Bible and the Bible only, you're going to be considered, he's out there. She's radical. He's way out there. They're fanatics. They're a cult. They're the, you're going to be considered to be so far out of the norm. And is that necessarily a bad thing? To be considered abnormal today, is that necessarily a bad thing? They don't do it the way we do it. They're weird. That person, they don't do it the way you. Pe people are 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 shocked. People are taken aback sometimes when they say, "Well, you know, um, talking about things in general, you might want to be talking about uh, diet and so forth." And you know, when you when they when they say, "Well, you know, you tell them, well, I'm a I'm a vegetarian. Oh, you eat rabbit food, huh?" I don't know of any rabbits that eat as well as I do, and I don't miss out on anything. Because God is good, and God has given us great minds, and God has given us a way to make really tasty, delicious things that are actually power, fuel for us, and they keep us going, and they help us in spirit, mind, and body. They, keep our, they help keep ourselves clean and pure and have only that which God would give us. So we can be healthy. Why? Because just like the Bible says, all things work together, don't they? Body, mind, and spirit works together. If your body doesn't feel good, your mind doesn't feel good, you don't feel very spiritual, you don't feel like connecting with God really, because you're too busy worrying about how sick or how bad or how horrible you feel. Well, the Lord said, here's what you can do. And he gave us all these things. And what I'm saying is God means for his people to be the head and not the tail. He's promised you and you and you and me that I would be the head, that you would be the head and not the tail. He wants us coming behind in no good thing. And he knows, do you, do you think God is aware how bad the economy is looking? Do you think God is aware of how much uh, 
Some, some people have better means than others, but do you think he's aware of how much some people struggle to put a tank full of gas in their car today? Sure he is. Do you think God doesn't care about that? God didn't wish that upon you and I. God didn't wish any of our sufferings upon you and I. God didn't put any of these sufferings upon you and I. It's sin. It's sin is the cause. But yet God, God takes responsibility for the cleanup. He said, you, my people, will never be ashamed. He said, I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. What's the locust? The locust is sin. The locust is all of the dirty, rotten, low-down, nasty things that people have done, that you have done, that I have done, the things that we've done to, to, to destroy our own lives, the things that we've done to cause and wreak havoc in our own lives, the things that other people have done to us, and yet God said, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. The years that you spend trying to self-destruct yourself, I'll give those back to you. Make, we're not going to see it in this lifetime. God's not going to double your years upon this earth and give you 40 good years to make up for the 40 rotten years. But we stick with Jesus Christ and we're going to have eternity with him. And we're going to know perfect health. We're going to know a perfect economy. We're going to know a perfect selfless government. We've never seen that. Never. Even the people with the purest motivations, the purest heart, there's still that human nature. And there's still that inkling of human nature that tends towards selfishness. What I would like to see, what I would like to get out of this. God wants us to be prosperous. God wants his people to be a happy people, to be a joyous people, but to be a people that are connected to him, that are so connected to him that we move completely in lockstep with him because God is what? God is love. And he loves his people. He loves his creation. He loves you and I. He loves everybody on the face of this earth. People that don't want anything to do with God. God loves them. And how do we know he loves them? Because he sent you and I out to go and catch them. Fishers of men. He sent you and I to put out the dragnet. He sent you and I to cast out the line. He sent you and I to go and reach out to him and tell him, tell them, tell them, tell them about Jesus Christ because he wants heaven populated. He wants his holy city populated and he wants them to be populated with the sinners of this world. He wants them to not stay sinners. Sin is miserable stuff. Sin is miserable stuff. When I used to do some of the things I used to do, I say, boy, this is great. And then when I'm feeling rotten about it, I say, oh, I'll never do that again. And then someone calls me, hey, you want to go do this? Yeah, I'll be there. You know, God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to have a joy and a happiness and a peace and a blessing that is without end. God is just so wonderful. But there's three things more than three things, but there's three things I want to look at that, um, that God is going to do. Three things that he's going to bring. Three things that is going to happen before this world is set aright. Before this world is set back in its original condition. There, there are three things that God's going to cause. The first one is... Restitution. The second thing is retribution. And the third aspect is resolution. All of those three things are going to happen on this earth and they're actually in process right now. We just haven't seen the culmination. Jesus hadn't come yet and put an end to everything. Put an end to everything. All of the goings on. Everything is going to come to a screeching, grinding halt at one time. God is good and when God puts an end to suffering he means the end of suffering. When God puts an end to sickness and death he means the end of sickness and death. When God puts the end to heartache he means heartache. When he said that all tears will be wiped away no more tears will be shed 
after that. All tears will be wiped away. God is so wonderful and loves us so much and wants us to be with him. But he wants us to know joy. Not just in heaven. He wants us to know joy right now. He wants us to know peace right now. He wants us to know love. True love. The love of God right now. Why? Because we need to extend it to one another. Not only that, we need to extend it to those who hate us. Jesus died for those who hate him while they were hating. While they were hating, he died for them. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the ones that were driving the nails didn't necessarily hate him. That was their job. It was either, it, it was either his... His hands nailed to that cross as they lost their head. Which one do you think they're going to choose? I mean, they didn't know about this God. Oh, okay, well, this is just some, some poor guy. But if I don't do it, i got to answer to Pilate. Or i got to answer to my commander. i got to answer to this. What's going to happen to me? I'm going to follow my orders. And that's it. But he said, but you know what? The priests, the Pharisees, those who sent him to that cross, those who holler, crucify him, crucify him. I'm convinced that they went into that with their eyes wide open. The knowledge that they had, the understanding that they had, the knowledge of the scriptures and so forth. They went into that with their eyes wide open. And he still said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They just don't know. If they had known what they were doing, they wouldn't have crucified the King of Glory. They just don't know what they're doing. And yet Jesus went to that cross and took his last breath with a prayer on his lips for those who crucified him. For those, for the, for the kangaroo court that sent him to that cross. If he did it, you and I in, this, in these last days are going to have to have that same resolve, that same love in our hearts for those who would do the same thing to us. And that's going to take the Spirit of God moving within you and I. That's going to take the love of God within you and I. And that's going to take a love that at a level that we, none of us may have known yet. I believe that those who are attached to Jesus Christ, those who are walking with Christ, those who have sold out to Jesus Christ, lock, stock, and barrel, are going to be tested to the maximum, and they're going to be surprised at the way they'll stand up for Jesus Christ when the moment comes. There, there were people when they were scattered during the persecution of the at, after Christ rose after he went to heaven and they were scattered I'm sure that they went and they may not have known whether or not they were going to have what it takes to stand up to this one stand up that one but you know what they boldly proclaimed their faith they boldly stood up for Jesus Christ and because of their sacrifice and what they did you and I are here today with Jesus on our minds because the reformers that we love to talk about, the reformers, the reformed faith that this church is built upon, the faith once delivered to the saints was passed on to them and then passed on through us because they weren't sure. They weren't sure, but when the moment came, guess what? They found out that they had what they needed because they'd been trusting in God. They kept their hand in the hand of Jesus Christ and He delivered. He delivered the strength. He delivers the power. And He's going to continue to do it. But in these last days, this great reset that they keep talking about, we know what it's about. We know that there's this thing called the mark of the beast. And we know that it's going to come into full fruition and we know that's going to be forced by on on the people who are going to resist but we also and, and we also realize that standing and not taking it is going to mean the end of every creature comfort it might mean uh, no warm place to sleep tonight might not get three meals today. Might not get one meal today. It just depends. I might be too busy being on the run. 
I might be too busy giving my last meal over to someone else who I just brought to Christ and I need to extend that love. We don't know what it means, but we got to be ready to stand upon what we are called to do, whatever the situation calls for. And in Christ and in Christ alone, we can do that. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. I love this. I know we just read it, but that's okay. I need, I don't know about you, but I need to read scripture more than once. I need to hear what God says more than once. I need the encouragement more than once. But Revelation chapter 21 and verses 1 through 7. John wrote, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. The former things are the things we're living right now. These are the former things. The former things are the things that we're going to go through upon this earth before Jesus Christ comes. Those are the former things. Once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write on, write on, and he said unto me, Write, for these things, these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty today for what God has to pour out? Are you thirsty for the love of God? Are you thirsty for this, for the, for that which He promises? This perfect world, the earth made new, and our part in it. Are you thirsty to 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 see your Savior? Are you thirsty to go and be united with loved ones who've passed? And, and, and be able to spend eternity with them. Are there people who you've read about in the Bible? I want to ask Isaiah this. I want to ask David that. I want to ask Moses this. But first I want to see Jesus. Are you thirsty to have his arms wrapped around you and welcome you home? He said, if you're thirsty, I'll give you from, from the fountain of the water of life to drink freely. God is good and he means what he says. And he says, He that cometh shall over shall inherit he that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Praise God. God is good and God is serious, and he's looking for a people who are serious as well. Uh, going to Malachi chapter four. We live in very serious times, very tough times, and uh, our faith has to be tougher. And we don't get tough faith, tough-minded faith by saying, I'm tough, I'm a tough Christian, I can handle it, I can handle whatever this world throws at me because I'm tough because of this, because of that. We get tough-minded faith from God. Jesus Christ had tough-minded faith. Amen? Jesus Christ had tough-minded faith. That's how he went through what he went through. He had faith in his Father. When the going got tough, we know it got tough on him. We know it got tough because that night in Gethsemane he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. And that's when the battle was won. The battle wasn't won on the cross. The battle was won right there. Satan was put down. Satan's face was put in the dirt right there at Gethsemane. Because the decision was made, now it was just the playing out of the events. Jesus said, I'm going forward with this, that's it. And, it's, and, and there's nothing left but the playing out of the events, the events of the next day. But Malachi chapter 4, and verse 2. 
But unto you that shall fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in a stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I will do this, says the Lord of hosts. These are the promises of God. These are the things for God's people to hang on to. These are the things for us to remember in these last days as, as things get tough. God is tougher. As things get tough, the promises of God endure. As we find that we need stronger faith and we continue to go to God, he's going to continue to increase our faith. He's going to continue to give us strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And remember what David said again. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Because you are with me, I'll fear no evil. Not because I'm so big and bad and bald on my own. You know, I, I, I've seen people, um, Christians, and I, I'm sure they mean well and everything, but they'll walk around with these t-shirts on say, Demon Killer, on it. And let's see how many you kill when they come up and they jump all over you and they attack you. No. You better have the whole armor of God on. You better have the shield of faith and your faith better be in Jesus Christ because it's Christ within you that's going to knock those demons off of you. It's Christ within you that's going to make them bow not to you but to your Father in heaven. It's Christ within us and if we don't have Christ within us we're not going to make it through. If we don't have Jesus Christ, if we don't have that faith within us and you know even from From within the body of Christ, attacks come. From within the body of Christ, dissension comes. Factions come. Things that are, that, that, that are distractions. The Bible tells us that Satan knows that he has but a short time. And I look at the body of Christ. I'm talking about the whole corporate body of Christ across all denominations. And I'm thinking, you know what? Satan knows how short his time is better than they know how short their time is. If he has a short time, that means we also have a short time to get the work done. We have a short time to finish what God has called us to do. And that means the people who you are called to reach have a short time before they die without the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The people who you and I are called to influence, you know, some of our greatest influence is going to be how we act when the chips are down. How we behave when we're thrown into prison. How we behave when our lives are threatened. How we behave at the moment that they're taken if they're going to be. And how we stand for Christ. How we stand for Christ. There, there are people, we read about them during the Reformation, who were burned at the stake and others would stand up in their place. And the people who were doing the torturing and the killing and the murdering were saying, what is it with these people? Nothing stops them. They see their brothers and sisters ahead of them being killed and they still continue to stand for this Jesus Christ. What is it about Jesus that makes them the way they are? Wouldn't you love it if someone came up to you and said, hey, what is it about Jesus that makes you the way you are? Man, what a conversation starter that would be. What is it about him that makes you love him so? What is it about him that makes you cling to him so? What is it about him that makes you refuse to deny him no matter what we do? What is it about this guy? Man. And sometimes we sweat just thinking how we're going to say two words as an opening wedge to tell someone about Jesus. Jesus said, let your light shine before men that others may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That they can observe our life, that they can observe what you and I do and know that we've been with Jesus and know that God our Father in heaven is the one who directs us by his Holy Spirit. That's what it's going to take in these last days. And that's what's going to bring about this great reset. It hasn't 
happen because when is the end going to come? When the gospel goes to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to every creature. Then shall the end come. Then shall the end come. The gospel message is going out around the world. But has it reached every creature? And has the true gospel, has the true gospel of Jesus Christ reached every creature yet upon this earth? Everyone who needs to hear. God isn't going to shortchange anybody. He's not going to say, oh, it's just too bad that they couldn't reach your corner of the world. I'm sorry, but you know, time's up and that's it. That's not the way God works. God is love. And he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And he hired and purchased with his blood you and I. And every single person that names the name of Jesus has the duty and the responsibility to tell this world about Jesus Christ. And that's what he's called this church to do. That great reset is only going to take place when the work is done, when God's work is done. He's going to leave nobody short. The, the, the restitution is when he restores to you and I the years that the locusts have eaten. The years that our own sin and even the sin of others has robbed all the goodness that God wanted to pour out upon us. All that's going to be restored. How? I don't know. God said he'll do it. I'll just wait and see what happens. That's all. I trust him. How am I going to do it? How is... How, when am I going to get it? What's it going to be like? How much? That's none of my business. That's none of my business. That's God's business. He knows. And if he knows, that's enough for me. If he knows that's got to be enough for us. If, 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 if we know that God loves us. If we know that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And he is king in our lives today. He sits on the throne of our heart. No matter what happens. No matter when it happens. When that day comes. When that day comes when all the saints of God are in heaven. Whatever restitution God has in mind is going to be poured out upon us. We're not going to believe. We're not going to believe the great and wonderful things that God has in store for us and what it is that he's going to bestow us. But it's not our job to worry about that. It's safe. It's in God's hands. Nobody can go and take it away. No one's going to scam it. No one's going to hack God's account and drain the account with your name on it of everything that's in it. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. There's not going to be a cyber attack on God's record system in heaven. He's not going to lose your name. He's not going to lose your reward that he has ready to bestow upon you. He just wants to make sure that you and I don't lose any of those precious souls that he has called upon us to witness to for Jesus Christ. That he has called upon us to rescue in the name of Christ. Pluck them. God is looking to plunder hell to populate heaven. And he's looking for an army that will go in and do the job. That's what he wants. And he has made you and I a part of that army. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. He's looking for those who are willing to say, yes, Lord. Yes, send me and I'll go. And then go. He's not looking for people who say, Lord, send me and I'll go. And Lord, I didn't realize it was going to get this bad. I'm turning back. He's not looking for those. He's looking for people who say, yes, Lord, send me and I'll go. And they go. And they go in the name of Jesus Christ. And a lot of times they go without not knowing exactly what's ahead. When I, when I first came to Christ and I began to read this Bible and I learned so much that, 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 that things that I learned before conflicted with and I said, Lord, I'm going to have to walk in a new direction. I'm going to have to do some new things. A lot of this is strange to me, Lord. I don't know where it's going. But I know you and I trust you and I'll follow you, Lord Jesus, wherever you lead. And that's the only reason why I'm in this church today. 
because when I was thinking about balking on it and so forth, you know, the Holy Spirit said, uh-uh. You remember what you told me in the very beginning? You'd follow me wherever I go? Well, this is where I'm going. Are you coming? I said, yes, Lord. It's got to be, yes, Lord. You'll never regret saying, yes, Lord, and then going through with it no matter what it looks like. So, restitution. There's also going to come a time of retribution. Those who rejected Christ, those who rejected the call of God and who died that way or who were found that way on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Uh, going to Revelation chapter 18. Uh, there's so much talk about the mark of the beast and so much, so many ideas about what it is and what it isn't and so forth. And I, I, we're not going to dig into the finer points of the mark of the beast today. But Revelation 18 has a lot to do with, uh, with with that in the way that it talks about people, about those who control everything. The movers and shakers of this world, we would call them. The captains of industry, the ones who create all the jobs, the ones who own all the businesses, the ones who have all the money, the ones involved in the big international trade and the multimillionaires and the billionaires and all and so forth. Well, you know what? Uh, chapter 18 and verse 1 uh, Actually, I'm going to begin in verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, meaning Babylon. He cried, verse 2, he cried with a mighty, with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hole of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We read about the wine of Babylon. And why it's to be avoided at all costs. And why Daniel said, uh-uh, I don't want any of that. Uh-uh, you're not putting any of that in my cup. They said, Daniel, you're going to eat like a king. You're going to eat with the king. You're going to eat what he eats. You're going to drink what he drinks. None, it's all going to be the finest and none of it's going to be withheld from you. But Daniel said, uh-uh. Daniel wouldn't drink the wine of Babylon. Why? Because he knew the corruption that was contained therein. He knew that if he got a taste for the king's delicacies, he'd want more. He refused to drink the wine of Babylon. And it talks about the, Babylon, about the wine of Babylon here. And there are so many people who don't refuse it, who accept it, and who drink it. And cry with them, with, again in verse 2, he cried mightily with a strong voice saying Babylon the great is fallen and is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the whole of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful thing for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich with the abundance of her delicacies and so they've made themselves rich they've 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 they buy these $300 million super yachts and they live like, like royalty aboard these things. And they buy themselves 747s and they get them remodeled with every appointed luxury. They stay in the best hotels. They go to the world's best vacation spots and, and, and they sit back and they just live off of all the profit. And there's nothing wrong with living off the profit that you make. When, when people go into business, they don't go into business to lose money. They go into business to make money. And they go into business to make a profit. Why? Because that's their paycheck. The profit is their paycheck. If they don't make a profit, they don't get a paycheck. So we need paycheck to live. We've got to buy food, groceries, keep a roof over our heads, so forth. Well, some people get so caught up in it that that's their entire pursuit to see how they can get more. And these people get more and more and more and more. Well, uh what happens is the bottom falls out. And, uh, and over in verse, 
verse 7. How much has she glorified herself and lived deliciously? So, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she has said in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall all her plagues come in one day. And mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the God who judgeth her. The kings of the earth who have, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and they shall see the smoke of her burning. Why? Because in verse 17, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors as many as trade by sea stood afar off and they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning saying, what great city is like unto this city? And they cast dust upon their heads. Did they put ashes on their heads because they were sorry for their sins? Did they put ashes on their heads because they were sorry for, for, for all of the lives they destroyed while they were filling their pockets? Did they put dust on their heads because they were repenting? No. They moaned and they wailed and they put dust on their heads because the hope of their gains was gone. The economy was dried up. There was no more trade. Nobody was buying anything. And you know, some of those people were the ones, well actually all of them were the ones obviously that accepted the mark of the beast. And they found out that everything that was promised to them, they couldn't get because the Lord shut it all down. I'm not going to read all the plague. Y'all can do that for homework when you go home. But the seas are going to be turned to blood. All the creatures in the ocean are going to die and everything, when there's no more water fit to drink, how much bottled water is going to be produced? Okay, and if you can't produce and sell a bottle of water, what's going to be missing? Cash flow, you got no cash flow. You can't pay employees. How many employees are going to show up to work when you can't pay them? The people, the truckers who get paid to ship the bottle of water, if there's no more truckloads of bottle of water to be shipped, how many of those guys are going to roll? What kind of pay? Everything is going to dry up. So the very thing that the beast promises, that in very short order, they're not going to be able to deliver on it. And you know what? Then everyone's going to realize that they've been had. Then they're all going to realize that they've been had. And they're going to, to try, some of them may try to repent at that time, but at that time it's too late, isn't it? The door of mercy has been shut. The last person to be saved, the last soul to be saved under grace has been taken. They've all been taken away to heaven. And there's only those left who have rejected Christ. Oh Lord, give me another chance. There is no other chance. And that's why God has sent his church to these people today to impress upon them that there is no other chance. Once, once it's over, it's over. Once the end has come, the end has come. And they need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Because there is going to be divine retribution. The Lord is going to take vengeance upon those who who. who speak on the cross of his son. Those who trampled the sacrifice of Jesus Christ underfoot. Those who squandered every opportunity. Those who slapped God's hand away every time he reached it out to them. Every time he tried to reach them. And they said, no Lord, not today. I'm too busy. I've got too much money to go make. I've got friends. To, how can I impress them? I've got talking about Jesus. They don't want to hear about Jesus. They want to hear about how can we get rich? How can we do this? How can we do that? Well, you know what? Jesus Christ is going to be the most important person in their lives one day. But it won't do them any good. Everyone who continues to reject Jesus Christ... One day he's going to be the most important person in their life. But it's not going to do them any good. You know why? Because they're, he, they're going to run and call upon the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. Anybody sitting in here today, don't be that guy. Don't be that gal. Don't be that person. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, don't walk out of here until you have. Don't. What are you talking about, preacher? i got another 20 years to live. You don't know if you've got another 20 seconds. Neither, none of us do. Don't take that chance. Oh, but I've been raising the church since I could crawl under the pews. Okay, but did you ever 
Give your heart to Jesus Christ. I've been raised in the truth. Okay. The Pharisees that yelled crucify him were raised in the truth. Raised in the church. They were raised in the Torah. They were raised with all of the feast days. They knew. They knew. And they said no. They still said no. Don't be knowing today and still be saying no. Know in your heart. Know that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And give your heart to him. Lord, no matter what it takes, no matter what i got to go through, no matter what it means from, for me, I'm going to walk hand in hand with you from this time on. Save me, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. The Bible said, if you shall do what? If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he was crucified and is risen, you shall be saved from your sins. We have to accept him lock, stock, and barrel. Accept him in our hearts and, well, I don't know if I could accept him today and keep walking with him tomorrow. He'll give you strength for today and he'll give you strength for tomorrow. He, God, you see, n no man has an excuse. The Bible tells us that God has dealt unto each man the measure of faith. That means when you were born, when you were an infant, and you came out of your mother's womb, you had the exact amount of faith needed to get saved. You may have denied that faith for one reason or another. You may never have developed that faith, but you can't say, God, I never had an opportunity. All men are without excuse because each person was born with that much faith. Each person was born with the exact amount of faith needed. Everyone was born with enough faith to know that there's a God. That's why in Romans chapter 1 it says they have no excuse. Creation itself witnesses to the glory of God. Creation itself testifies that God is real and that God is love. Look at how he takes care of all his creatures. Look at the wild animals. They get fed every day. They get water every day. They get clothed every day. They get taken care of. And, and, and yet Jesus said, how much more valuable are you than they even? God created us at the top. God created us as the crown of his creation. And you know, out of all his creatures, and there's so many magnificent creatures... Humans are the only ones he gave the gift of speech to. I mean, each and every animal has their own speech. Birds, you know, they can communicate, and other animals through growls or grunts or, or bodily acts, they have their own way of communicating, but, but man is the only one that God gave this gift of speech to. And how often do we use it to deny our God? To curse the name of our God? How often do we use to say, no, not today, Jesus. Come back next week, maybe we'll talk about it. No, we need to use that gift for God's glory. And use that gift to reach others if words need to be spoken. I don't remember who said it, but I love the quote that says, Preach the gospel always. If necessary, use words. We can show the love of God with everybody that we're with and let them know how short this time is and what's going on. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. Bitcoin, uh, this, this, this cyber currency and all that. This is going to be another house of cards. You see, men have tried for thousands of years to build systems of government that were going to work and were going to last forever. But the only government that's everlasting is the government of God. That's the only one. And, you know, we, we know that um, Revelation chapter 20. Uh,
and verse 7. When a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as of the sand of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth and, and surrounded the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. You see, even, even after a thousand years, uh, that didn't change anything. Satan was still Satan. And when the wicked dead were raised, he was able to marshal the troops and go after the city one more time. But it can't be taken that way, can it? It can't be taken that way. It has to be given. Have to be invited. And fire fell. We know that, uh, that, that, that Satan and all his cohorts get thrown into the lake of fire. We know that death and hell itself gets thrown into the lake of fire. God, the last enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is an enemy. Yes, death is a product of sin. Death has, has passed upon all men because all has sinned. Death is a product of sin, but death is also an enemy, and it's an enemy that can be destroyed, and it's going to be destroyed. Praise God. Every tear, we're never going to know what a tear is again. We're never going to know what a moment's heartache is. We're never going to know any of those things that we know in this life other than the joy, the love, and the peace of God. We're going to be serving God. We're going to be living with God. We're going to be loving God. And he himself is going to be our God. And the resolution finally. God is good. God is so good. Um, again. And I heard an, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first Heaven and first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So there's resolution to all of this. And I want to read one paragraph from this book right here. From the great controversy. And, you know, some of the best news in any book, some of the best news and the culmination of the, of, of the book is in the back of the book. Excuse me. And the very last paragraph of the great controversy says it all. I, I love reading uh, Ellen White's writing because it slows you down. It really slows you down and gets you to look and think. Sometimes when you read scripture it can get to be like when, when you start to get toward the end of a chapter or whatever it can be like you know the horse running for the barn. There it is which is about done. Well this slows you down and it gets you to think. It makes me think. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness. Throughout the realms of illimitable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, 
All things animate and inanimate in their own shadow beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. That's it. That's the day. I don't know about you, but that's the day that I'm looking for. I don't, I, I don't want to rush any of the days. I believe every day is a gift from God. And we're here to make the most of every day. But that's the day that I'm looking for. When all the pain and suffering is over. When, when God's perfect plan for man is going to be carried out throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. And we're going to have all that time to get the answers to our questions. God's, I can't wait for that day. I want to see all of you there. I want to see me there. <laughs> so many people I want to see. And I don't want anybody here. If you don't know right now that that's where you're going to be, don't leave this place like that. Don't leave until you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. Don't leave until you know your sins are forgiven. And there's nothing more in your heavenly record right now. Because there's one who's going to make sure that God knows everything you did. Amen. And you know, uh, Martin Luther had a dream. The great reformer Martin Luther had a dream where he dreamt that he had, uh, that he was standing uh, at the judgment bar. He was there, he was standing at the judgment bar, and uh, Satan was there, and he had the record. He had the record of all of Martin's sins, everything he had done, every dirty, despicable thing. This man calls himself a Christian. He, how can he be one of yours? Look at this. Look at this, 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 this here. And he showed it to Martin. He said, he said, how can you possibly stand before a holy God with all of this on your record? And in that dream, Martin noticed that uh, Satan's hand was over something in the bottom corner of the document. And he said, what's that? Satan, what's what? He said, behind your hand, move your hand. He said, yes, every single word on there is true. Yes, I've done that, I've done that, I'm responsible for every single bit. But, what, but I want to see what's under your hand. So he made Satan move his hand, and the hand said, paid in full blood by the blood of Jesus. Not the hand, the corner. Paid in full by the blood of Jesus. Your record can be paid in full by the blood of Jesus if it's not already. And you need to know that. Talk about need to know information. You need to know. I need to know. If there's anybody at all uh, who's unsure, don't leave today until you are. Ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. He's asking you to ask him. He wouldn't extend the, he wouldn't extend the invitation if he didn't mean to come into your heart and to change all of that today. He wants you in the kingdom with him. We want you in the kingdom with him. God is good. And you know what? If you walk out of here today and you don't know Jesus and uh, you manage to live, he's going to come at you again. He'll ask you again. God never gives up. You know, even, even the person who most vehemently refuses him, he still comes back again at some point. You know, I know people who uh, 90 miles an hour try to run away from God. And I, I just tell them, look, the faster you try to wait, run away from God, the sooner you're going to run right smack into him. God never gives up. God loves you and he loves me and he loves everybody who loves you. He loves everybody who hates you. God loves everybody who hates him. But that door of mercy is going to slam shut one day. And that's going to be it. Make sure you're on the right side of it when it does. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love today. We thank you, Lord, for your great patience with us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that your, that your pursuit of us is relentless. And Lord, we want to be with you for eternity. We want to be in heaven with you. We want to be living in that new Jerusalem with you, Lord. And we want to be able to help get as many others to come along as we can. Give us the strength, Lord. 
the withal, Lord. Give us the, 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 the purpose of heart to reach out to all people we can with your, with your truth and with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to live good, faithful lives, Lord, to do all things pleasing in your sight, Lord, that the whole world may know that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God is love. Be with us this day, Lord, as we leave this place, but not your presence. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.